Well, that's the sort of blinkered philistine pig ignorance I've come to expect from you non-creative garbage. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Vic Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Sihuatakutli, boys and girls. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 47. Ah, I am your host on the left, Rish Outfield. And I'm the host on the right, Big Anklevich. Nice. Okay, he's here too. I'm announcer man. And the big announcer man. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah. Today's episode is, deep breath, The Strange Affair of the Artisan's Heart by Joshua Reynolds. About the author, Joshua Reynolds is a writer of average skill and above average confidence and has sold a number of stories to a number of places, often for money, but also in return for food, books, and once a goat. The Strange Affair of the Artisan's Heart has previously appeared in Permuted Press's Robots Beyond anthology, which is still available at the Permuted Press website, Amazon.com, and a number of other places. If you buy it, the author, Joshua Reynolds, promises to do a little dance. You won't be able to see him, but rest assured, he will dance. To voice complaints about not seeing him dance, visit his blog. We'd also like to give special thanks to Josh Roseman for the editing on this story. And today's music is La Traversée by Ima. Also, there are several sound effects from the freesound.org website. Check the show notes for links. The Strange Affair of the Artisan's Heart by Joshua Reynolds Here you are, sir, the driver said, his accent pure East End, and his disdain pure British. Ulrich Popoka frowned, hearing the hesitation before the sir. Still, he said nothing, deciding to err on the side of politesse. Instead, he opened the door of the carriage with a long-fingered hand. His axe blade nose wrinkled as he caught a whiff of the effluvium from the electric gas lanterns mounted on the roof of the carriage. Foul things. The mirror systems of Atslan were far more efficient. Not to mention they didn't smell like an overturned privy. Still, when in London... When in London, the catchphrase for the modern diplomat. Ulrich frowned, rubbing the engraved golden half-mask that clung to one side of his dark, angular face. Beneath it, the tracks cut into his flesh a year earlier by the obsidian knives of the Nasiatal, the meat tacks, itched and throbbed. It hurt sometimes, but one did what one must to keep the crops growing and the sun rising. Still, he longed to pull the mask off and let the cool air from the Thames caress his hurts. But a diplomat's trained sensitivity to cultural differences prohibited this. The English, indeed most Europeans, he had discovered, were not as fond of scars as his own countrymen. Such a sensitive people. Except for the Prussians, of course. Not an ounce of feeling among that lot. He stepped down onto the cobbled streets his handmade John Lobb shoes disappearing into the thick swirl of fog below knee level, and fastidiously adjusted the drape of his coat. He was a tall man, lean and broad-shouldered. Though his suit was of a fashionably European cut, he had nonetheless insisted on the proper colors. The ensemble, purple and green and turquoise, was much more appropriate in these gloomy climes than the drab greys and tweeds of which the English were so fond. Even so, the Savile Row tailor the embassy had procured for him had all but keeled over dead from shock at the specifications. Ulrich smiled and rubbed the obsidian head of his cane with a calloused thumb. Such a dour, depressing people. 
It was obviously the lack of sunshine. Either that or their reliance on the whims of industry, as opposed to those of the gods. No magic here in these cobblestone streets. No life, no soul. Only cold technology. Iron and steel. His own people had technology, it was true. But they did not rely on it to such an extent that it strangled their beliefs, their faith. Across the street, the river was lit up like a golden sea. Lights on the tower bridge casting flickering bursts across its oily surface. Popoka winced as the smell caught him flat-footed. He'd been in London for just over a year now, and he had yet to get used to the stink. The house he'd been summoned to sat on the edge of the Thames, overlooking its dark expanse. The carriage rattled loudly as its driver pumped the reins and the clockwork horses were urged to a steady trot as superheated water shot through them, the visible gears in their shoulder joints whirring with oiled precision. One whinny, releasing a burst of steam from its engraved nostrils into the night air. Popoka stepped hurriedly aside as the carriage clattered down the street, back towards the Ameriketslan embassy. The driver obviously knew his business. Popoka wouldn't need a ride back anytime soon, if the message he'd received was to be believed. Popoka rubbed his half-mask, looking up. A dirigible hove slowly into view. It blocked the stars, a vast bag of gas and heat. Back home, only the sons and daughters of Quetzalcoatl were allowed in the sky. He shook his head. Here, in this savage place, any fool could take to the clouds. The places one went for gods and country. Ulrich walked across the street, his cane tap-tapping, and up the steps to the flat-looking little building across from him. It seemed exactly like every other building in London. Slanted rooftops and ugly colors. Unlovely windows glaring out of sooty brick walls like the eyes of an idiot. This city was an ominous thing when placed up against the golden glory of the cities of home. All dark and grim, smelling faintly of fish and ash. He rapped lightly on the door with his cane, the black stone thumping deeply against the wood. The door swung open seconds later and a face composed entirely of varying sized copper plates was thrust out at him. He stepped back in mild alarm. Come in, please. The metal face gushed words like steam from a split pipe and disappeared, the door opening wide. An automaton. Ulrich restrained a grimace of disgust and stepped through, cane tip holding the door open as he slid inside. He looked down at the stick-thin clockwork doorman dressed in blacks and browns and raised his one visible eyebrow. The little TikTok man held out his hands, paws composed of brass tubing and steel wires. Metal fingers clinked against one another. Your coat is fine where it is, thank you all the same, he said, skin crawling at the thought of unliving fingers touching him. Your coat, the automaton said again. Its voice didn't change, but it stepped forward, hands reaching, its manner quite insistent. I'd rather you didn't touch me, thank you all the same. Popoka tapped the machine in the chest with the tip of his cane. It rocked back on its heels and started forward again. Your coat, your coat, your coat. Blasted Tinker Toy! A pudgy, pale-faced gorilla of a constable stomped out into the hall, his helmet in hand. He swung the helmet by its strap and sent the machine stumbling aside. He glared apologetically at Popoka. Sorry, sir. Damn thing keeps warning itself up. Popoka heard the same old hesitation in the constable's voice. The same old look in his eye. Familiar as Cortez's revenge, coming back on you the first time you tasted English water. He frowned, looking down as he felt a tug on his pants cuff. Your coat, the clockwork man said, reaching up, still trying to do its duty. Quiet! The constable kicked the down machine. Popoka's eyes didn't even flicker. Hardly a decent way to treat the furniture, I shouldn't think, he said idly. What you think, don't... The constable began, pale face flushing. He rounded on Popoka, accent going north. I do believe I agree. Stop kicking the tick-tock, Constable Frogmore. Do come in, Ulrich. A melodious voice flowed over the incipient argument like honey. Popoka looked up, scars tightening as he smiled. Si watakutli, Falucci. Terwatsintika. Tusopilik machipa. Please, dear Ulrich, no need for flattery. 
and certainly no need for honorifics. Call me Francesca, the woman said, her voice filled with easy warmth. She was tall, taller than Popoka, and clad in jodhpurs and a red silk hunting jacket, the color of a pumping artery. Her hair was plaited in dozens of thin, intricately woven locks. A poppy cigarette hung limply from her full lips. Eyes like steel wrapped in velvet swept over Popoka's mask, a tiny ember of disgust burning briefly within them before fading. Whether it was for the scars the mask hid or the meat tax itself, Popoka did not know, nor did he, in truth, care. He had met her his first week in London during an investigation into a bizarre rash of killings around the Whitechapel area. The killer had turned out to be one of his own countrymen, a Nahual, a shapeshifter. The countess had been most helpful during that final moonlit rooftop chase when the creature had turned on Popoka and tried to devour him. Even now, a year after the fact, one look from her was enough to wash away most of his cares in a deluge of good humor every time they met. No matter the circumstances, Popoka pushed past the gawping constable and strode towards the countess, cane tucked under his arm, hands held out to grasp hers. If you insist, if you insist. I always do. And one day, perhaps I might even listen. I live for that day. Do come in. Frogmore, place the TikTok with the others. The Countess, still gripping one of Popoka's hands, pulled him deeper into the house. Imposing prole. Wherever do you find them, Countess? Popoka said, sato voce. The Countess smiled. Are you referring to the doughty constable? Him and no other, I assure you. Frogmore works for Division 13 of Scotland Yard. They handle the... Strange eggs. Makes them a bit... Tetchy, Felucci said. Several of his chums are lurking around here. Keep to the path and perhaps we'll avoid them. She laughed. <laughs> and just what is going on? A crime, of course. Why else would constables be here? And why are you here, Prisel? Popoka asked, twirling his cane with one hand as they walked side by side. They reached the end of the hall and the countess grasped a curtain separating the sitting room from the hall. For the same reason you are, dearest Ulrich, politics. She said, whipping the curtain aside with a deliberately theatrical flourish. The sound of gears, previously muffled by the curtain, filled the room, and strange shapes crept across the walls and floor on legs of steel and brass. Popoka looked around, eyes wide. What? On behalf of the Diogenes Club... Welcome to the clockworks, Ulrich. Clockwork creations of every stripe, step, and function sat, walked, flew, and crawled through the limited confines of the sitting room. Dozens of them, including several clad in the clothes of servants and scullery maids. Like the doorman he'd encountered in the hall, these were roughly human-shaped, insomuch as the automaton act of 1891 allowed. Good gods, Popoka whispered. He looked at the countess. Kesky. The entire staff. Only proper, really, considering this is one of the three top automaton production centers in London. The Clockworks produces the highest quality, individually tailored automata in Great Britain. Maybe even the continent. Impossible. Popoka spluttered. I, I, I've seen the Manchester automata factories. This place is far too small. As I said, individually tailored. The Countess gestured at the closest of the clockwork machines. Each one a work of art. And just who was the Amantecatl? Well, up until a few hours ago, he was. The Countess gestured airily at the body laying on the floor, partially wrapped in someone's formerly tidy bed linens. Now the white were a sodden crimson. Popoka grimaced and sank to his haunches beside the body. He slid the edge of the linen back with the tip of his cane, getting a glimpse at the face beneath. A uh, Persian? He said, glancing up at the countess. She shook her head. The Persian. It was both a title and a name. Surely there's more than one Persian in London. Many, nevertheless. Yes, I, I suppose. Hang on a tick. Popoka leaned closer, then looked up. He looks familiar. Been in the newspapers, perhaps. Spot on, my heathen chum. Must you? Popoka said. The Countess laughed mm -hmm. and continued. Indeed he has been. It is he who was to be the designer of the new bodyguard to the Queen. A tick-tock tinker toy soldier for Regina Gloriana herself. Hardly useful, I should think. Automata can't harm human beings. 
the punch cards that act as their brains lack any sort of violent information. That was one of the first laws passed under the Act of 1891. One doesn't have to inflict violence to be a bodyguard. First law of automata. Neither through action or inaction may an automaton allow a human being to come to harm. The countess said, eyes closed, reciting from memory. She chuckled. Really, it's the perfect guard dog. It never sleeps. It doesn't talk. Can't be bribed. Perfect. Maybe, but you'll never catch me trusting my life to a machine. Can't say as I'd do it either, but it shows herself to be a modern monarch. One for the industrial age, as it were. Popoka shook his head and looked at the body. What happened to him? See for yourself. Popoka pulled back the rest of the linen and gagged slightly as he caught sight of the origin of the red stains. An abattoir stink rushed up around him all at once and dispersed slowly. The countess held a scented handkerchief to her face, eyes watching his face. I see why you called me. Popoka let the linen fall back and stood. Where is his heart, by the by? I was hoping you could tell me. The police responded to a report of screams. When they found the body, they called Frogmore and his fellows who, in turn, called my superiors. Because of whom this gentleman had been pre-corpus? Exactly. And I called you, hoping you could tell me how he wound up that way. And why exactly would I know a thing like that? Because of what I haven't shown you yet, the countess said mysteriously. Popoka rolled his eyes. He gestured with his cane, every twitch filled with exasperation. Siowatha Kutli Felucci, your company is delightful as always, but I begin to think that this is more of a matter for your rotund friend from the Diogenes Club than a simple heathen ambassador, or perhaps his hyperactive younger brother. Why, Ulrich, darling, you're annoyed with me. She pouted a moment before jabbing his chest with a finger. But you simply can't leave without inspecting the crime scene. Then let us do so. I do not like to spend much time with the unliving, he said, casting an eye at the automatons around him. Several of the smaller ones were attempting to tidy the body, he noted with disgust. He resisted the urge to kick them. Poor savage, ever uncomfortable with the wonders of civilization. The countess said, mock sadly. Popoka snorted. I'd hardly call this dingy patch of wet civilization, my dear lady. Most unbecoming in a diplomat. Didn't you know being sent here is considered a punishment among the home office's crew? Popoka smiled. Now let us hie to yon blood-stained ground. Hi. Hi. That is an English word, yes? Quite. Let us hi, then. Over yon. The countess grinned, waving a hand at a doorway across the room. The scene of the crime awaits. The smells of blood and oil mingled in the room. Dismembered parts were strung up on every wall, glinting in the light of a Tesla lantern hanging from the ceiling. Clockwork parts, arms and legs and other appendages, useful for a variety of situations. Gears and tubes were piled up on the workbench that took up the length of one wall, and a shelf of rolled-up diagrams took up space on the other. The workshop of an artisan. The blood on the floor took away a certain something, however. Popoka tapped at the floor with his cane, watching the tip stir the congealing blood. It was not quite dried, denoting that the killing had occurred recently. His mind boggled at the speedy response of British bureaucracy. He was killed here, in this spot, he said. The countess clapped her hands once, twice. Masterful bit of detection there. Your sarcasm is noted, but unappreciated. Popoka kept his eyes on the floor. And you didn't ask me to come for what pitiful abilities I might have in that regard, did you? Not as such, no. I asked you to come, dear Ulrich, because of what is under the blood. Under the... Popoka sank to his haunches and cocked his head, eyes narrowed. Huh. Symbols had been scrawled in chalk on the wooden floor. They were must and faded, but had probably once been quite brightly hued. The countess leaned over him, hair falling across his face. Popoka sneezed and waved at the errant hairs. He stood abruptly and the countess stepped back. Well? She asked, her tone eager. 
The symbols are familiar. They're Ameriquettes, then, aren't they? She clapped her hands together in triumph. I knew it! Uh, was that the only reason you called me out here at this time of night? To verify your theorem? Popoka asked, voice cold. The Countess smiled and shook her head. Not entirely. I also need to know what they mean, exactly. I... Popoka looked at her and shook his head. Fine. He tapped at the markings, eyes flashing over each one in turn, from left to right all the way around the circle. And it was a circle, a circle of symbols drawn with careful precision. He stepped back. Huh. What? The Countess said. It's a sacrificial ring. These symbols here, on the inner line of the circle? He indicated with his cane. They're the different identities of one of the gods, the one to whom the sacrifice was offered. Which was? Tezcatlipoca, or rather the aspect of him that is Nikok Yautl. Popoca rubbed his half-mask. The enemy of both sides. Nice name for a deity, the countess said. We have something of a collection of creative titles, yes. Footprints. Footprints is hardly what I would call creative. No, footprints, Popoka said, pointing. Bloody ones. I assumed those belonged to the gentleman corpse. No, too large, these. The size are up, I believe. Popoka cocked his head again, examining the prints. There's our man's prints there. He was standing when he lost his heart, facing his attacker. Popoka leaned forward, licking his lips. He straightened. The attacker's prints move there, then there, he said, pointing with his cane. Then back here. He was looking for something. Such as? Not a clue. But I can say that those are boot prints. Russian manufacture as well. And how do you know that, pray tell? If there is one thing diplomats recognize, it is footwear. At least among my countrymen. It's the only way we can tell you Europeans apart sometimes. How droll. I strive for humor in all things. Strive harder, the countess said. She was standing at the workbench, pawing through the items on it. Obsidian, she said, turning around. Popoka took the piece of black stone from her. It was part of a larger piece. See these markings? Somebody made something out of obsidian. Several somethings by the look of the pieces. Like what? Maybe mirrors, Popoka said. Tezcatlipoca means smoking mirror. The priests say he has an obsidian mirror for a foot. The question is, why would a Persian artisan have a sacrificial circle to an Ameriketslin deity in his workshop? The countess said, staring at the floor. Popoka shook his head. Actually, a better question might be, if his heart isn't here, where did it go? And who took it out of him in the first place? I'll see you those and raise you this one. Where exactly is the blood going? The countess said quietly, gesturing. Popoka looked at the bloodstain. What are you talking about? He began, then stopped. The blood, congealing though it was, had been returned to some semblance of liquidity by his idle stirring, and now it was in the process of slowly, slowly seeping into the cracks between the floorboards, but only in a certain area, an area roughly the shape of a square. Trapdoor? Popoka looked at the countess. She smiled. Trapdoor. That answers questions two and three, I surmise. Popoka walked towards the bloody square. It looked just like any other section of floor. He looked up at the ceiling for a second, then down again, pondering. He smiled. Of course. Of course? A horse is a horse. And a tinker is most certainly not a tailor, Popoka said. The countess frowned. What? This. Popoka raised his cane and struck the tip against the center of the square. Once. Twice. Three times. Tap, tap, tap. The square began to descend, carrying him downward with a groan of gears and a sudden upward draft of cold sea air. Russian boots, a dead artisan, and a clockwork seaside trap door. It's a penny dreadful come to life, the countess said as she watched Popoka descend. He held out a hand with an elegant twist of his wrist. And one you'll miss out on, unless you'd care to join me. Lay on, Ulrich. The game is afoot, the countess said as she hopped gracefully onto the small platform and grabbed tight to Ulrich's coat. Actually, a pair of feet, I'd say. And a heart, he said as they sank into darkness.
The sound of water was loud, the babble of cold waves and the flush of not-so-distant sewage pumps excising the waste of London into the Thames. As the platform stopped with a creak and a thump, the underground room was suddenly illuminated by a half-dozen softly lit lanterns. The sudden flush of light revealed two things. The first was a jetty where a tiny skiff was docked. The second was the presence of two figures, one in the boat, one frantically attempting to untie it from its moorings. The one outside the boat turned, a snarl on his ursine features. A heavy coat hung from his broad shoulders, and his blood-spattered boots were of the style worn by the Tsar's Cossack guard. He was a big man, a terrible, looming presence with iron-gray hair and long mustaches that hung from under his flat nose. But it was the other figure, the one clothed in a priest's robe and sitting in the prow of the boat, who caused the hairs on the back of Popoka's neck to stand up. The countess hopped off the platform, her hand flickering into her coat with feline speed. She pulled a Webley revolver from the holster hidden in her coat and aimed it unerringly at the big man. Greetings, County Old Witch. So lovely to see you once again. Countess Felucci, you are a vision of loveliness as always. E. Old Witch grunted, his words heavy with Slavic shading. But I simply must be going. I would have expected you to be already gone, slowing down in your dotage. He couldn't find the trap door. That's what he was looking for, what those bloody boot prints signaled. Isn't that right, Count? Popoka said, stepping up beside the Countess, leaning on his cane. The Persian hid it well. He used this jetty for secret orders, I am told. Creations which, well, the buyers would be ashamed to have seen in light of day. Yildvich grinned, showing a mouthful of long yellow teeth, the front two of which had been replaced by delicately shaped rubies. He gestured at the hooded figure behind him. Such as this one. The figure rose at his signal, clicking limbs unfolding until it stood upright. The boat rocked, but the figure gave no sign it noticed. Yuldvich looked back at the Countess. You would be wise to let us leave, Countess. My new friend here and I... No. No, I rather think not. The Countess aimed her pistol. I think instead I shall place you under arrest as a foreign spy, Count Yuldvich, just as I would have done in Shanghai had you not had the good fortune to escape upon that Chinese junk. The devil does provide... Yildvich shrugged unapologetically. But do not say I did not warn you, woman. He glanced at the hooded figure. Miketia! The countess looked at Popolka. What did he... He said kill them, Popolka said. That's idiotic. Automatons can't... I don't think it knows that. Move! Popolka shoved the countess aside, even as the automaton leapt from the boat and landed where they had been standing, wood splintering beneath its heels. It tore the robe from its form, revealing a brass exterior, molded to look like a hussar cast in bronze. Its skin was made of hundreds of tiny interlocking plates, each engraved with curling designs. Spurs adorned its booted feet, and an officer's jacket covered its torso, buttoned to the chin. A bulky shako topped its head, a filigreed golden feather rising from the top. Its eyes glowed with an internal light, and heat boiled off of it, filling the air with a rank odor. Popoka slid away as it swung a fist at him. The countess rose to her feet, pistol barking. The slug struck the automaton, staggering it. It whirled, metal fingers flexing. Its mouth opened with a whisper of gears, and it hissed like a steam engine, red light spilling out of its mouth. Good God! The countess shouted as it lunged for her, impossibly quick. She ducked under its reaching hands and threw herself between its legs, rolling to her feet behind it. It drove its fists into the brick of the wall before it could stop itself and pulled them loose, accompanied by a shower of mortar and mold. What is this thing? Why, your sweet queen's bodyguard, of course. Yildvich crowed. Once it has finished killing you, I shall deliver it to the palace personally. Madness! Popoka snarled. He stalked towards Yildvich, twisting the head of his cane until it came loose with a snick. Without flourish or gesture, Popoka drew his sword from its hidden sheath and aimed the point at Yildvich's heart. Sheer insanity to think you would get away with that, especially now. Scotland Yard have been alerted. Yildvich spread his arms, watching Popoka come. Perhaps. I did not count on the police arriving so swiftly through. But then again... Perhaps not. Perhaps the finished automaton will be found hidden in the Persian's workshop. A shame he was murdered by someone seeking to steal it for themselves. 
but his name will live on, I suspect. By the time they find your bodies, it will be too late. The damage will be done. The war will be started. And you, you will be dead. Ulrich, look out! The countess shouted. Popoka dropped to his knees as two brass hands slapped together where his head had been, filling the air with the ring of metal on metal. He threw himself to the side as a fist crashed into the ground. The clockwork Huzar loomed over him, red eyes glaring. Popoka thrust blindly, his sword slipping between two plates on its chest. The creature squalled and reared back, dragging his sword from his grip and pulling Popoka to his feet. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of Yildvich drawing an obsidian dagger from within his coat and lunging at his side. The countess's pistol cracked, then again, and again. Yildvich oh. grunted and staggered back, suddenly off balance. He toppled into the boat, causing it to shatter and capsize. He disappeared beneath the black waters without a sound. Popoka leapt forward, reaching for the hilt of his sword. One chance, only one, a one in a million chance to be exact, and he took it with both hands. His straining fingers wrapped around the jaguar hide that covered the hilt, and he shoved the blade as deep as he could, further into the crevice where it was lodged. The clockwork Huzar screamed and its back arched. It clawed at the air and fell backwards, landing on the ground with a sound like a wall of metal cookery crashing to a kitchen floor. The red light in its eyes faded as it trembled, then lay still, inert metal once more. What? The countess said. Popoka stood, knees weak, and pulled his slim sword free. Dead. Or banished, if you prefer. What do you mean, banished? The countess said, holstering her pistol. They could hear voices above them and booted feet. Constable Frogmore and his fellows responding at last. What was that? The queen's bodyguard. Or assassin, rather. Popoka said. He showed her the tip of his blade. Fresh blood glinted in the lantern light. I'll wager that when it is opened up, you will find the Persian's heart suspended between a number of obsidian panels or mirrors. We call them spirit cradles. They only maintain their function so long as the heart remains intact. And what, dear Ulrich, is their function exactly? The countess said, making a disgusted face. For my people, it is a way to talk with our gods face to face. For Ioldvich, it was a way to circumvent the automaton's programming. Magic beats technology every time. Are you saying it was possessed? The countess said incredulously. Popoka smiled. You've seen stranger things in your time with the club. Yes, but those were in foreign places, never here in England. The countess shook her head. So you're saying Yoldovich summoned a god? Well, actually, in this case, the spirit was not a god, but a Talakat Ikalotl, a demonic aspect of a god, Nakak Yaultl. The enemy of both sides. The countess murmured. An American Ketzlan devil inside. The killer of the queen, Popoka said, sheathing his sword. And war between our respective empires is the result. And the Russian Tsar ready to capitalize. Clever, clever, Yildovich. Speaking of devils... The countess looked at the black waters of the Thames suspiciously. Looks like this particular one has slipped away again. I saw you shoot him, Popoka protested. The countess smiled and nudged the flattened bullets laying on the edge of the jetty with the toe of her boot. Magic beats technology every time. Huh. Popoka tapped his shoulder with his cane. Well, this was certainly an interesting evening. Near death aside. Wasn't it just? We should do this more often. The countess said, bending over the automaton and examining her reflection in its polished face. No, no, I really don't think so. Popoka said, heading for the ladder. In fact, I rather believe I shall be ignoring further messages from you in the future. That's what you said last time, and the time before that. The countess called after him, laughing. <laughs> Popoka, a trained diplomat, was easily able to pretend he hadn't heard her. Author's note. I wrote The Strange Affair of the Artisan's Heart 
because I wanted to write about Sherlock Holmes fighting an Aztec mummy, as so many people do. Needless to say, that isn't what the story is about. Instead, I wrote about an Aztec detective fighting an English robot. It's not really the same, is it? Still, it's interesting though, I think. Hope. Anyway, I also like alternate history, hence the Aztec Empire still hanging around by the 1890s. There are also Vikings, but they're not in this story. Vikings with guns. But that's neither here nor there, is it? I piddled around with it for a few months, going one way with it and then the other, before I caught wind of Bermuda Press and their Robots Beyond anthology. Inspired and lacking money, I finished it up and with some assistance from Lane Adamson, the editor, tidied it up into something resembling a professional manuscript and hey, presto, it got into the anthology and here we are. It was a strange little exercise in world building, but I like it. I hope you do too. Te Watsintika, te sopalik mochipa. Oh hell no, big anchorage! I hope you enjoyed that story as much as I did. What did you really just say? I have no f***ing idea. Ah, okay. Well, at least you're honest. Yeah. First and foremost, let's talk about that. Okay, so this guy sent us this story, and I just said absolutely not. We are not <laughs> taking this story. I don't know if you have my notes anywhere. A hero of mine said, A man's got to know his limitations. And the line in the sand for me is pronouncing Aztec words. Okay. <laughs> So I probably pitched a fit like I do most of the time. Also because it was steampunk, but not that so much. So Josh Reynolds sent us a pronunciation guide for every name, greeting. All those words, yeah. We had a syllable-by-syllable syllable pronunciation guide for them, which was cool. But yeah, Josh Roseman edited the story for us. And I feel bad for him because, yeah, he had to sit through our recording. You know, the, the story runs about 30 minutes long, but when we recorded it, I'm pretty sure it took us two hours to get this all down. And we sent that whole file <laughs> we sure to did. Josh Roseman. We just dropped it in his lap and said, I hear you want to edit. Here, enjoy. He was cool with it, which is nice. I'm glad we didn't drive him away and make him never want to work with us again by doing so. Probably a good 10 or 15 minutes of that file was us steadily working our way through the pronunciations of these things until we got them to uh, fast enough speed that it sounded like we were actually saying real foreign words and not just reading a bunch of syllables with dashes in between them. Now, did you have you heard the edited file that Josh did? Uh huh. And does it actually sound like we know what we're talking about? Yeah, it does. It sounds wow. pretty good, I think. And yeah, I, I don't want to oversell this, but I don't think it's possible to oversell how hard it was to do this this Aztec <laughs> stuff. Yeah, the funny thing was about this is, yeah, you did pitch a fit. You're like, you know, this is a really good story. It's well written. It's clever. It's it, It'll actually probably even work in audio. But uh, I'd rather decline this guy's story than have to say these words. And so I'm like, dude, this story's good. I'll say the words. So so you volunteered to read the whole bloody story so that I wouldn't have to tackle any of the right. uh, pronunciation, which was kind of you until we read the story yeah. and it all <laughs> fell onto me. Yeah. <laughs> we accept stories and then usually like a month or two goes by where we're doing the other stories that, we, that we've accepted previously. And then it's like, OK, time to read this story. We pull it out and we haven't seen it in like a month or two. And so we or don't ten. remember exactly how it went and how many characters there were and how many voices and et cetera that we need. You know, he cried about these words. So I figured I'd volunteer to uh, do the narration so that I would say all the words and he wouldn't have to deal with it. But it turned out and we didn't realize this until we're like 15 minutes into the reading of the story and we're not going to go back and start over. But yeah, all the Aztec words fell on his shoulders. They're all in lines by Popoka and not in narration. Uh, okay, well, as far as the story goes, the other important thing to say, besides how much I hate steampunk, is this was not the first story that Josh Reynolds sent us. That's he, true, yeah. He actually sent us... What was the name of the first story? The first story was called The Strange Affair of the Skull at the Window. 
And I read that, and then you read that. And you said, sounds like this is a sequel to something that happened before. They mentioned further adventures. So we asked Josh. Is there a first story where they all meet? Yeah. Yeah. And and he says, well, this is a sequel. The first story, they don't all meet. They already know each other. But you, you guys are welcome to that story, too, if you want it. Now, did he say it was just two stories? Or does he have a whole gaggle of these? Yeah, I just said gaggle. I don't know if you could call it a gaggle. But I think there's four in total, and that was years ago when he first submitted the story to us. You know, now he may have written four more stories. Who knows? We have also already uh, lined up the sequel to this story to produce in the future, because I enjoyed it a lot. Rish hates steampunk. How could you tell? Why do you hate steampunk, Rish? I'm curious to know. Is there a, a reason behind it? Well, you know, hate is a strong word, so... Let's say that I dislike steampunk. Okay. And, and the reason that? that I do is because it reminds me of cyberpunk, which I do hate. What, how does it remind you of cyberpunk? It's got punk in the name. Okay. Do I really have to have you, a reason? You despise Punky Brewster for that same reason, huh? Oh, Brandon. It's Dead was, on, folks. That was a really, really good impression. You know, you do a lot of impressions, and some of them are good, and some of them aren't. But that one was probably your best yet. Cyberpunky. <laughs> I think we need to do a story someday called Cyberpunky Brewster. She's Punky. in some kind of disfiguring accident, right? Yeah, and she's downloaded onto a computer. And in there, there's an AI in the computer. That's named Glomer. Ew. <laughs> so sad that we both remember Glomer. And maybe there's a cyber construct that's called Brandon, and it's her dog uploaded, and Mr. Warnamont. <laughs> what the F is Mr. Warnamont? What was his name? Wasn't it Warnamont? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it was. And Mr. Warnamont, like, plays on the computer, and, and then Cyberpunky comes and helps him do stuff. <laughs> You said it, 08 OT. Back on topic, guys. Uh, well, see, there you go. That is the reason. And no offense to Captain Reynolds like... of the good ship Serenity. I have a friend who used to always talk about steampunk. And just, I, I'm blown away that we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, you know, I made a, a choice then and there that I would not support steampunk. Just because your friend talked about it? Yeah, that's probably the main reason. Personally, I mean, I don't dislike it and I don't like it. I maybe I do like it. I don't know. I kind of like, I kind of like steampunk. To tell you the truth, it's got like a certain imagery. It's like this whole strange and, and where did it even come from? This whole like sub genre of sci-fi where it's some kind of strange. I guess it's like an alternate timeline kind of a thing where technology developed much earlier and it's all based on steam powered stuff and they go around in blimps and everybody wears like these crazy old timey outfits and stuff like that i remember seeing some folks at comic-con when we went several years ago and there was like a whole group of people that were all dressed up in steampunk outfits they were cool man they're they're interesting outfits and it's like an interesting uh they were jagoffs, all right. You are. You're a jagoff. Hey, it's funny too because I can't think of a lot of films I've ever seen that are steampunk. Have you seen any steampunk films? I don't know. I kind of want to say that Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow might be a steampunk, although not. No, no, no. That was a totally dead-on depiction of what life really was like back then. Oh, interesting. Didn't you tell me once that you saw a anime movie that was all steampunk and you were like, whoa, this is so cool. And then your friend said, well, you've never heard of steampunk before. There you go. There. That's the genesis of my hatred of steampunk right there. You've tied it back. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Yeah. He, he was an anime that he brought over. It had no tentacle porn in it, so I had no interest. Oh, yeah, you and just was like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. It was so clever and so unique. And yeah, he, in his snooty way, he explained that it wasn't unique. And then he used that dread word. <laughs> and from then on, I had to stand for something. And I chose the anti-steampunk movement. I didn't know there was a movement. You're the only one in the anti-steampunk movement. I think there are, there are Amish members that oh, yeah. they don't come to a lot of the meetings because there's churning to do. But uh, yeah, they're out there. 
it's funny to hear you say you don't like steampunk when you have no good reason for it. It's like any other genre, I think, where there's good steampunk and there's not good steampunk. There's good cyberpunk. There's not good cyberpunk. There's liars! extremely dense cyberpunk that you have to be a programmer or worse to get through. And then there's... Jag off. That's the word you're looking for. (laughs) There's some that are uh, good for regular people to to read. You know, anybody can read it and they can understand it. And then there's others where I don't know who you got to be to enjoy it. It just depends, I guess. And and all I can say is Rish is wrong. Steampunk isn't bad, but there is bad steampunk. And there are snooty people that make fun of you for not knowing what steampunk is. And if that damages your psyche for the rest of your life, I guess, you know, that happens. I think Big is right. (laughs) <laughs> so another roadblock to uh, accepting this story of my mind was I frankly had no idea how these characters would talk. In this alternate timeline, do Aztecs, do people from America speak Americanese? Yeah, do do they, they speak with Spanish accents? Do they speak with British accents? Do they speak with Southern accents? Okay, well, I have... think we can rule that one out. Yeah, they could speak with some kind of boston accent some new york who knows what kind of accent they might end up with they, they speak with accents. that crazy alien accent that josh reynolds actually has <laughs> now he no, just called his accent alien no offense i think suki stackhouse kind of speaks that same way too but we've got a kiwi actress trying to speak southern there Heart. but josh uh, he does have a very unique accent uh, we're gonna have to have him record the line little kids always think farts are funny would they sound like Native Americans? How dare you? It's Indians. Never. So I can't say that Josh has an alien accent? That's mean. No, no. I, I, I didn't say illegal alien. <laughs> You're like the modern day Hitler. Oh, I knew that somebody was going <laughs> to go there. Okay, so I assume that we just had free reign to do whatever accents we wanted and uh, do them badly. <laughs> but, <laughs> Woo! But, but, you know, somebody who doesn't do really crappy accents uh, is the girl that you got to be the Contessa. Oh, right. Pelucci. Tokyo Lap Lap Tees Pelucci. I can't remember what the heck the word was. Sickening American <laughs> piece of crap. Yeah. Now, we had her do the English accent of the wife on the first michael stone story what was that called raising archie yeah that was our third episode ever and yeah we needed somebody to do a female english accent and at that time we had nobody to turn to we hadn't gotten all the volunteers and all the friends and any to uh, help us out that we have these days and it just so happens that i knew this girl who lived in england for a while and and i asked her if she could and she went at it and showed us just what it's all about and uh, then she went back to England. And so, yeah, we haven't had her back for a long time. But as soon as she was back, I was like, hey, you want to do some voices for the show? And so, yeah, she's she's back at it. And see, I, I, as far as the Countess goes, I didn't know if she should have an Italian accent <laughs> yeah. or an English accent. And so, well. Yeah, we, we went with – I went – I decided we should go with English just because of the things that she says. She's a this loyal servant to the queen and – Anybody who's talking like that has got to have an English accent. Oh, that works. Huzzah. Huzzah to you, my friend. All the accents. And and boy, we've done a lot over the year and a half we've been doing this show. Um, I know that some of them probably aren't great. Some of them seriously suck. Some of them kind of suck. Some of them are all right. I've been told that that I have a Dick Van Dyke level bad Scottish accent. (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, no, somebody did say that about Klob. They said, wow, where did they dig up Dick Van Dyke to do that accent? Because oh. that was terrible. Dude, I resent that. Whoever said that, Dick Van Dyke is not dead. Rish, you're such an idiot. The whole accent thing is sometimes a struggle. And, and to be honest, there are certain accents I frankly cannot do. Now, one of them would be, however... Josh talked in his author's note. I couldn't do that if somebody threatened to PayPal us. But another one is we had a story and it was an Irish story and all the characters had Irish accents. And I tried, I tried when I read it to do Irish and it sounded like the worst parody of Braveheart, which is Scottish. (laughs) You know, it sounded like Christopher Lambert doing. No, you know, he was better. 
I, I don't know what it was. But ultimately, we just had to turn this guy down on his story because I would have slaughtered it, man. In fact, the entire UK would have revolted. It would have been World War Three, And I like the Brits. And I would hate to have them kill me. Yeah, there are some that you just don't dare try. Some that are certainly going to be bad. And, you know, we accepted old Rick Kennett's reluctant ghost hunter Ernie Pine stories. I, you know, I love them, but I know that it's going to suck if I try and read it. Or if Rish tries and read it, it's going to suck twice as bad. You said it, Big. So, yeah, we had to go out and recruit some real Australians. Maybe we should have tried to see if we could recruit some Irishmen. I don't know. But uh, we did actually have to say, you know, we like your story. Love to do it. But if we did it, it would be hideous. And, you so. know, that's that's something that I've heard on all the other podcasts that actually have listeners where they do stories. Sometimes they'll have an Englishman doing a character from Connecticut <laughs> or they will have a good old boy talking about going down to Heathrow. Oh, this is much better. Because there are so many readers out there who are at professional levels and they're doing all this crap for free. It just seems like, okay, at least get the country right. <laughs> and, you know, I apologize, though, if my English accent has ruined your listening enjoyment in the club stories or if my Russian accent uh, sucked in this one. But we do give it the old college try. Mm-hmm. So lastly, I guess this is uh, the third series we've picked up on our show. True, although we can't really count it until we run the second story, I guess. Huh? Thank you, Josh, for sending this story. Uh, and hey, I apologize if I offended you. I, it's meant to be a compliment that I could not imitate your accent. But you have done a great service here in that now there is a steampunk story I like. Whoa. Now, yeah, we've already established that I'm not very well read, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to hold that up as a point of pride next to my anti-steampunk banner that there is one steampunk author that I dig. Right on. That's cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have actually had your mind changed a little bit, broadened, opened, you might say. Yeah. You've become more liberal. Oh, wait, that's a bad word open-minded oh you use my words against me spirit <laughs> hey uh there is one thing that we wanted to announce a, a pretty important announcement that we wanted to put out there for everybody to know about hey, hey can, I, can i do it oh, folks sure we, it's been a great run we've enjoyed bringing these stories to you but we're just we we, we just can't do it anymore we, we, we're announcing the the end of the dune steef uh, our last episode to hell with all of you guys and dude that's not the announcement i think you must have confused what i was telling you earlier oh okay well you you do it then uh, i'm sure you'll sound more professional anyway yeah the actual announcement is as we head into the holiday season here coming up we're going to not close down the show, but we're just going to close the uh, show for submissions. We'd like to have the holidays off and not have to evaluate people's stories over that time. So we're just going to close the show to submissions. You know, we'll, we'll open them back up in 2010 and you can start sending in your stories again then. But just for the uh, remainder of the year, we're closed for submissions. We've got so many stories standing by that we'll be fine. There'll still be plenty of episodes. You won't notice any change in, in that. But uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to close down submissions for a little while. We've got lots of stories that we have accepted that we haven't had a chance to record yet. And we wanted to give a break to our associate editor, reader people. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let you you guys know when it's fine to submit again so get your submissions ready to overwhelm us when that happens i've been waiting and now it's time to beg for donations ah oh, come on man we have to do it wow you say that with such conviction you're mocking me aren't you have you ever noticed that he just repeats himself every time we get him in here uh, huh hey calm down don't take it out on announcer man well, we'd be better off with a friggin' robot. And don't take it out on 08 OT either. Look, we'll just briefly ask for donations and get it over with. I don't want to. I know you don't want to, but like the man said, we gotta do it. I think it's my least favorite part of the show. How about pronouncing Liz's last name? Okay, second least favorite. Look, in the time you've been whining, we could have begged for donations and asked people to give us a good review on iTunes. Really? 
Yeah, and if we go on much longer, we could have asked people to tell a friend about us. Maybe even vote for us on Podcast Alley. Wow, when you put it that way, I guess it wouldn't take much to just tell people to press that PayPal button on the site. Folks, I don't like doing this much more than he does, but we really do need listener donations to help us pay our authors. We had a really cool writer email us the other day saying we could do one of his stories on the show, but he was marking it down as a charitable donation because of our low, low pay rate. You know, I I like to think that writers are paid back in good karma. Rish, you're especially stupid. I uh, might have to agree with the announcer man on this one. Once again, uh, this has been Rish Outfield. And Big Anklovich. Hey, hey, Big, how much time is left in the episode? Uh, we've actually gone past our time. What do you mean? Well, I don't think we have enough storage space to even be able to post this episode anymore. You know, if people would just donate more, we could put up more episodes, more space, you know. So, are you sure we're out of time? Absolutely. Okay. I got another game I put together after how successful the last one was. It's another movie quote game. Yep. But this one is Star Wars or porn. Warning. Today's episode contains themes and language that is unsuitable for children or educated peoples. So I'll give you a quote and you have to determine if it's from Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi or from Pubic Enemies, Spank You Very Much 3. Who washes the crotchman and asks me no questions to well. For example, the Force can be a strong influence on the weak-minded would be... Star Wars? There you go. What do you say? Um, we didn't get a lot of participation in the last one. Okay. Participation. Number one. <laughs> Look at the size of that thing. Star Wars. That's correct. Number two. Oh, ma'am, these pipes really need to be bunged out soon. I think it was Jar Jar that said that one. So that must have been from... No, wait, you only wanted the original trilogy. So that's got to be one of those porn quotes. You are correct. Oh, wow. Number three, get on top of it. I'm trying. Star Wars. (sighs) Okay. Number four, you've got something jammed in here real good. (laughs) <laughs> that's star wars too. number five yes uncle ian i've been very naughty what is my punishment <laughs> that would be ask me no more questions <laughs> number six how can they be jamming us if they don't know we're coming uh, that one is return of the jedi number seven At that speed, do you think you'll be able to pull out in time? Star Wars. Number eight. Starlight Lurky, come quick. Oh, I'm sorry. That was from Rainbow Bright and the Star Stealer. I don't know how that got in there. (laughs) It's Ah. pornographically bad anyways. Yeah. Number nine. Possible he came in through the south entrance. Guess that's Star Wars. (laughs) All right. Number ten. Gee, Mr. Caldwell, what are you doing in the girls' locker room? That one is pubic enemies. <laughs> Just Star Wars or porn. You don't have to identify the... Uh, the oh, I mean, I haven't seen that. That one must be a porn movie. Okay. Number 11. Hey, point that thing someplace else. Yeah, that's Star Wars. Uh, number 12. I've always wanted to be f***ed by a strange hairy man beside a filthy dumpster. Oh, um... That one was from Edward Penis Hands, wasn't it? <laughs> and, that one's porn, right? And the 13th quote, you came in that thing? You're braver than I thought. That one is, ask me no more questions. <laughs> Indeed, 13. I shan't. Oh, hey, uh, one more thing. We're, we're, we have a promo to play. Oh, really? Okay, well, you know, I did need to go to the bathroom, so I will just be right back. <laughs> All righty, then. It's a promo for the Deed Robot Society. Hey, 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 Club, you're not invited in this episode. Back in the box. And now, a word from our sponsor. My name is Justin McCumber. I'm the creator and one of the co-hosts for the Dead Robots Society podcast. 
Every week we discuss a variety of topics that are fundamental to the craft of writing, from the differences between tone and theme, to world building, to how to create compelling antagonists. Along with the roundtable discussions, we've also had the pleasure of interviewing published authors, television writers, podcast luminaries, publishing house founders, and magazine editors. We're dedicated to our listeners, and we work hard to pack our episodes with as much quality education and entertainment as possible. We never stop encouraging ourselves and our listeners to always be writing and to always be improving. The promised land of publication is our goal, and we know that together we can achieve it. If we can also have a good laugh along the way, all the better. You can find us online at www.deadrobotssociety.com. At our website, you'll find show notes, links to our personal sites, our email address, and direct download links to our episodes. You'll also find a link to our forums where we've created a private critique group so that you can safely post your work and get comments and suggestions from us as well as our listeners. All we ask is that you participate by critiquing in return. So come to our site, subscribe to our show, and join us. You can also find us at iTunes. Just search for Dead Robots and we'll be there. After that, get writing. We are. You know, I look forward to the time when R-O-8-O-T joins the Dead Robot Society. It's all right, O-8-O-T. It's a writer group. Yeah, just keep telling him that. Oh, you know, I actually listened to the Dead Robot Society podcast long before they ever sent us a, a promo. Isn't that weird? No. That's crazy. You know, maybe it's not as uncanny as I'm making it out to be. Uh-huh. Mm, it's like, yeah, that might be You true. know, I actually heard that Aerosmith song one time before they used it in a movie soundtrack. You're like, oh, really? Well, that makes you special in no way at all. Yeah. Nice try, though. Goodbye from the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. 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 Magazine.